This is Duke University. Good morning. Thank you so much for coming. Um, so I want to um, say a thank you to the organizers for putting together what's been an exciting and enriching set of conversations and for reminding us of the importance of the insurgent practice of thinking black futures. I look forward to sharing my contribution with you. I open my talk with an epigraph by Martinican writer and philosopher, Edouard Glissant. The noise level had meaning. The pitch of each sound had meaning. Slaves understood each other by means of a subtle noise system in which the master, however skillfully he spoke basic Creole, was totally lost. The cast of masters never managed Creole at the top of their lungs. Thus did the dispossessed man organize his speech by weaving it into the apparently meaningless warp of noise. In my work, I broadly examine the racial politics of noise, how and why black subjects get constructed and stigmatized as being unusually and unacceptably noisy. Beyond ideas of sonic impropriety alone, I am interested in the ways that aural disturbance becomes the basis for a wide swath of state and institutional policing tactics targeting black subjects, spaces, and occasions of assembly. For instance, as justification for eviction from white dominated space, or taken as grounds for anti-black surveillance, suppression, and paramilitary terrorism. And so the two news articles I'm citing here, the, the first one is um, the story of a, a group of black women who are evicted from a Napa Valley wine train for laughing too loudly. And the second is um, one of the news headlines from the murder of Jordan Davis, who was shot and killed by a man um, who um, accused him of playing his music too loudly in a parking lot, and also had a lot of claims about feeling endangered because of the volume of his music. There is a way the soundscape operates both as a kind of private property and as a zone where national belonging is informally negotiated against black subjects. Black sonic trespass can justify extreme measures of eviction or violence or alternatively distinguish belonging members of the body politic from an improperly civilized underclass. The injunction to be silent is often enforced with the full force of the law and protected from accusations of anti-blackness through appeals to what I refer to in my work as a quote, common sense. A universal and objective aural sensibility, the idea that we hear uniformly and that we know noise or indeed music when we hear it. I purposely invoke this term's dual resonance as a fantasy of an objective universal aural sensibility, so the, the literal sense that we are all, we have a common sense of hearing. Um, and in its colloquial iteration as what the late Stuart Hall described as a form of everyday thinking, that which requires neither forethought nor reflection, which has become intuitive and pragmatic through repetitive performance and discursive circulation. But as the Glissant epigraph reminds us, black peoples have often taken up noise as a useful grammar of expression, measure of counter surveillance, and strategy of subversion. One that asserts a right to acoustic space as part and parcel of making broader claims to space and citizenship. By noise then, I refer to that which is constructed and sedimented over time as disruptive of intransigent structures of oppression rather than an umbrella term for all experiences of aural disturbance. It preemptively codes enactments of black vitality, joy, pleasure, and community as harmful and unpredictable environmental and sensory toxins. And my work, um, I don't present on it today, but I do think about the rhetoric of environmental toxin as it is applied to noise. Um, and, and how that's kind of um, used against uh, black subjects, envisioning, envisioning them as a kind of environmental toxin. Challenges to anti-black acoustic orderings are forms of what I dub sonic insurgency. Complicating readings of the soundscape as a liberatory counterscribal zone, 
I demonstrate how the soundscape becomes a critical zone of racialized conflict and contend that slavery has fundamentally conditioned how contemporary governing bodies police and regulate black sound. Today, I want to walk through one instance of these tensions as they unfold in Jamaica across the colonial and independence periods. In the 1816 Jamaica Slave Code and in colonial correspondences circulating in the 1930s, criminalizing discourse surrounding black noise and assembly persists with surprising consistency. In Jamaican writer Michelle Cliff's 1985 and 1987 novels, well, really just the 1985 novel I'm dealing with today, she depicts black subjects who clash with colonial authorities through quotidian noise, poetic performance, and militarized sound. All these items, I argue, share a preoccupation with two historical emblems of sonic insurgency in Jamaica, maroons and their iconic tool of sonic communication, a cow's horn named the abang, after the Akan word for horn. So this is, excuse the kind of overlapping visuals. The top left is an image of the abang, the cow horn that I'm talking about today. The top right is the novel that I'll be discussing. And the bottom is um, a Jamaican newspaper that I'm going to say a little bit more about now. Not only was the abang a critical tool of colonial resistance used by Jamaican Maroons, it has persisted as the moniker attached to a number of Jamaican anti-colonial projects, such as the abang newspaper, a radical leftist and pan-African publication that emerged in 1960s Jamaica, and Michelle Cliff's novel, Abang, famous for exposing the contradictions and absurdities of the late colonial era in Jamaica. Cliff's novel, Abang, traces the development of an Afro-Jamaican woman, Claire Savage, who in spite of her father's attempts to alienate her from her black and Jamaican identities, embraces her identity and joins a group of revolutionary guerrilla fighters that are ultimately executed by the Jamaican military. The novel might be read as an extended exploration of marinage as a still fertile and needed strategy of resistance in a Jamaica that is in the throes of neo-colonial exploitation. So there's a way that she's calling upon the legacy of marinage in a moment when, in the kind of post-colonial moment, when one might imagine that the uh, legacy of marinage is somehow obsolesced. Curiously, whenever the text explicitly invokes maroons or marinage, it bursts out of conventional prose and into poetry enacting a kind of textual errancy, confounding the distinctions between genres, housing poetry in unexpected places. The text pronounces how these moments serve as explicit, as explicit sonic disruptions of colonial common sense. By reading these texts together, first walking us through the legal terrain of colonial noise prohibitions, and then proceeding to Cliff's experiments with sound, I highlight Cliff's textual soundscapes as critical sites of sonic insurgency. The colonial administration viewed the soundscape as being an especially apt breeding ground for rebellion. Slaves, authorities feared, would plan rebellions under the guise of leisure gatherings, could communicate plans for rebellion with music, could be roused into a state of rebelliousness if they were permitted to hear the wrong sounds. The code threatened penalties for masters who allowed, quote, strange slaves to assemble together and beat their drums or blow their horns or shells upon any plantation, pen, or settlement under their care or management, and provided that, quote, all officers, civil and military, are hereby empowered and required to enter into any plantation, settlement, or other place to disperse all such unlawful assemblies and to suppress and prevent all unlawful drummings or other noise. This particular indictment of drums and horns is a reference to the then well-known military tactics of Maroons who communicated military information using drums and the abang. British colonial authorities in Jamaica, having fought two wars with Maroons by the early 1800s, learned to fear these rhythmic and musical sounds as a tactical language they could not speak, as signs of fomenting rebellion. 
These military uses of drums and horns were not unique Afro-Caribbean developments, but represented African cultural and tactical inheritances as well. By prohibiting the uses of these instruments, the law attempts to enforce a kind of temporal disruption, one which through prohibition might sever the lines of African cultural inheritance that would provide general, generational access to this repertoire without explicitly naming them as features of a longer unique tradition of black military strategy. The law further cryptically urges that all other noise be suppressed and urges that sound be monitored, especially in the event of assembly. Noise here marks a shift to preemptively understanding all forms of sound emitting from black subjects and sites of assembly as having the capacity to organize and induce rebellion. My language of sonic insurgency then references marinages and colonial laws explicit coupling of noise and rebellion. The 1816 Code's indictment demonstrates that colonial authorities responded to these subversive uses of sound by commanding the force of the law to impose quiet as a tool of colonial management. Black sociality for colonial authorities becomes an aggregated cluster of violent practices with a single purpose, to overthrow colonial rule. This anxiety around what can happen when black subjects assemble at night amid the din of music did not disappear with emancipation. In 1934, 30 years before Jamaican independence, Jamaica's inspector general wrote to the British colonial secretary with a familiar complaint. That venues of black working class assembly and leisure, noting bars and brothels specifically, were becoming too noisy and recommended that they be more tightly regulated. He writes, quote, these brothels or temperance bars keep open till all hours of the night and accompanied throughout by music of all kinds. So another recurring motif is the sense of noise at night. So the sense that if a curfew isn't put in place, the noise might endure endlessly. Um, and I think that has more to do with um, the cover of darkness and how that impedes colonial surveillance than anything else. Um, so. These brothels or temperance bars keep open till all hours of the night and accompanied throughout by music of all kinds and naturally are a source of attraction for all classes to concentrate around, but of course, chiefly the lower orders. And the noise is increased by conversation, laughter, etc. He recommends decisively at the end of the letter to effectively stop the present and most obnoxious nuisance of noise at night by musical instruments in particular. This should be entirely forbidden after 12 o'clock midnight. There's a consistent cluster of factors that link the 1816 code and this correspondence. Black poor or working class subjects coded here as the lower orders, independently assembled, producing widely audible or amplified sounds, calls for total prohibition of activities at night. Newly added to the fray of stigmatized black sound is conversation and laughter. The inspector general taps into a familiar repertoire of racial stereotypes about black excess, that black voices, even in the context of festive assembly, are inherently and unacceptably loud and disturbing in sore need of regulation. This is also a clear indictment of black sociality. It's not just that they're talking and laughing, but that they're talking and laughing amongst themselves, finding pleasure in community, seeking belonging in common spaces and experiences. An editorial in the colonial newspaper, the Jamaica Gleaner, published only one month before the inspector general's letter, urges that the police be authorized to disband these gatherings, writing that this is important, quote, especially when the fleet of tourists are here. These will not wish that Kingston or any town of the island should acquire or retain the reputation of being a body bedlam, end quote. Suppre suppressing noise then is about making sure that the island is and appears to a white global north, to white global north tourists to be under control. Indeed, for the island to be attractive to tourists, the colonial administration had to first prove that its black majority was obedient unlikely to protest, to rebel, and induce bedlam, 
This fear of bedlam signals actual concerns about rebellion in the 1930s. Labor riots erupted across the British, the British colonies in this period. Black poor and working class laborers protested the denial of living wages, the barring of access to positions on legislative bodies, and so on. For black subjects who are already a century removed from slavery and expected freedom to bring a drastic improvement in their circumstances, their economic, social, and political prospects, um, remained shockingly similar to what their forebears lived through. When these, two docu the, when these two documents then seek to suppress noise issuing from spaces of black assembly, they are also encoding their fear of rebellion and their hopes to quell it by, inhi by inhibiting the social spaces where black solidarities are constructed and affirmed. Colonial authorities, however, understood that the most incendiary claim of black labor organizers was that slavery had ended only in name and not in practice. A dangerous statement for a dissatisfied black labor base and for a Britain that prided itself on having purged itself of the moral ills of slavery and was selling the fantasy of Jamaica as a peaceful tropical paradise to sustain the burgeoning tourist economy. As such, both pieces avoid any explicit commentary on race relations or the riots. The Gleaner author instead declares that, quote, everybody knows how severe Kingston's noise problem is. That, quote, anyone who lives in the vicinity can hear it. That, quote, whole neighborhoods are kept awake by it. An appeal to common sense, again. The soundscape was like the nation conceived as a space that did not belong to Jamaica's majority black laboring class. Jamaican poet and novelist Michelle Cliff anticipates these links between soundscape and sovereignty and the unique challenges that acoustics pose to soundscape regulation in her novel, A Bang. This novel, famous for its depictions of the quotidian practices of colonial rule in Jamaica, displays a sustained concern with how clashes between Afro-Jamaican subjects and strongholds of British colonial influence play themselves out sonically. While the city of Kingston is a major hotbed of sonic contest in the novel, the scenes set in the Jamaican countryside, I would argue, depict a more radical form of sonic insurgency. So Kingston is in the sort of southeast corner of Jamaica, and the scenes I'm about to describe take place in St. Elizabeth Parish, which is in the, on the kind of western end of the island. Um, the novel's magnified sense of political possibility in the countryside is reflected in what happens to the text formally. It breaks out of the conventions of prose and introduces poems, folk songs, and performance. Notably, Cliff highlights St. Elizabeth Parish, located in the southwestern region of Jamaica, the home to Akampong Town, a semi-autonomous maroon village in the northern hills of the parish. So Akampong Town has been um, an independent settlement since the mid 1700s. So it's a very important kind of emblem of anti-colonial resistance. Um, it is against the backdrop of this historic geography that we are introduced to Mr. Lewis Powell, the sole teacher in a small Afro-Jamaican school that Claire's mother once attended. Mr. Powell is the sole instructor for children ages six through 15 and works from teaching manuals forwarded to him by a colonial office response by a London colonial office responsible for, quote, the state education of children in the Crown Colonies. The manuals describe in particular a poetry curriculum that includes British Romantic poets Keats and Wordsworth and Victorian poet Lord Tennyson. Perhaps more notable than the poets themselves are the instructions for recitation that accompany the colonial poetry curriculum. Students were to memorize Wordsworth's iconic daffodils, or I wandered lonely as a cloud, and the poem was to be, quote, spoken with as little accent as possible. Here as elsewhere, the use of pigeon is to be severely discouraged, end quote. In addition, students are instructed to recite the poem while examining a large drawing of a daffodil included in the colonial curriculum materials. The school teacher, Mr. Powell himself, a lover of poetry, though, has a curious habit. He inscribes his own poetry on the backs of the colonial daffodil images he receives from the London office and decorates his walls with his poems. Quote, so when he lay on his bed, his own words were visible to him, 
Powell's response to the colonial stigmatization of uniquely Afro-Jamaican cultural forms and geographies creates for him, is to create for himself alternative surroundings in the confines of his room, a kind of echo chamber that amplifies his own voice and creativity. As if to signify the impossibility of seeing and indeed hearing oneself, Powell barricades himself with his own words against the colonial denials of Afro-Jamaican culture and environment. His words on the back of an image of a daffodil form a kind of palimpsest that metaphorizes the conditions under which Afro-Jamaican forms and voices must find expression in unexpected places with unlikely materials, a kind of improvisation. A second example of sonic insurgency that occurs within the novel's textual soundscape is when Mr. Powell organizes a poetry recitation for his students and their families. Selecting one of his students, Zoe, to act as the highlight performance, he assigns her a poem entitled Maroon Girl by Jamaican poet Walter Adolph Roberts. At this point in the text, the novel does not simply narrate Zoe's performance, but instead reproduces the poem as a standalone entity and, in, and, and italicizes the font. This encourages the reader to engage the poem as a standalone entity, even as we experience it in the context of Cliff's novel. So this is just, um, excuse my own <laughs> notes in my novel. <laughs> this is true literary scholar work. Um, so I just kind of want you to see visually what happens to the text when the poem appears. It's not just that the novel narrates that she is reciting the poem. It breaks the actual prose and inserts the kind of the poem into the novel in this way. Um, Maroon Girl is a sonnet written in the present tense, and its central figure is situated amongst the perennial flora of the island. Orchids, hibiscus, orange, and coffee blossoms. All other markers of time are absent. The first person narrator sees her not in a discreet and passing moment, but rather sees her perennially as an emblem of Afro-Jamaican's tradition of resistance against the colonial state. The grammatical property of aspect is critical here. Where grammatical tense situates an event in time, when it happened, past, present, future, aspect tells us how an event in unfolds through time. For instance, whether the event is confined to a moment or continues to unfold. The poem is written in the simple present tense, I see. So that's distinct from I have seen or so on, right? So this is a temporally unbounded tense, which lends itself to an aspect of continuation or habit to marking the ongoing or the transhistorical. The present simple extends indefinitely into the past and the future. It is a tense reserved for universal truths, fixed present arrangements, and routine and inalterable future events. Simply put, this tense extends temporally in all directions. It signals an existence that has always been and will continue to be. Indeed, the poem's references to perennial flora and landforms make it possible for the audience to inhabit the first person narrator of the poem to be in the text's words taken by the poem. They could recognize the poet's images and his words. They knew hibiscus, mountains, forests, orchids, end quote. The poem pushes against the colonial curriculum's attempts to estrange Afro-Jamaican students from the familiar features of the island's landscape and prompts a collective imagining of the maroon girl. So its function is in, in a sense as a kind of mnemonic and a counter history to that of colonial domination. Finally, critical webs of affiliation are established through rhyme and stylized type, typeface. Arawak and Black establishes a solidarity and resistance between indigenous peoples and Afro-Jamaicans, linked by histories of enslavement and extermination. The additional rhyme of Black and Arawak with attack declares a right to resistance against a long history of colonial violence, while the rhyming of died and pride references those who died fighting for freedom, providing a counter-narrative against the structurally enforced shame associated with being a person of African descent and an inheritor of the legacy of the violence of slavery. The italics of the poem link it with a few other moments in the novel where slave laments and traditional Afro-Jamaican folk songs interrupt the prose in a similar way as standalone texts. So it creates this um, sort of sense of affiliation between forms that are typically viewed as, um, as, as very different. So to close, 
In 2012, the Jamaican British historian of music. The article notes that this designation was assigned by Taurus. And this is actually, this was taken very seriously. There was a lot of research about how to establish stricter noise regulation and reason. The enforcement is a different story, but there, it was kind of t taken seriously. It sounds really weird. Um, the article notes that this designation was ex assigned by tourists, explaining that the Jamaican government had been persuaded to take measures to curb the public airing of music at night, so the same motifs again, after, quote, sleep-deprived tourists complained about the noise, <laughs> especially in and around the resorts. Note how the discourse of noise becomes readily available, not just to suppress black subjects, but to buttress an external sense of entitlement to the labor and cultural production of the island's peoples, to Jamaican space altogether. Unscalable life, Clementine Hunter's painting over the wall. I start with two epigraphs. The first is from Anna Singh from an essay called On Non-Scalability. Quote, the plantation shows how one must create terra nullius, nature without entangling claims. Native entanglements, human and not human, must be extinguished. Remaking the landscape is a way to get rid of them. Then exotic workers and plants or other project elements can be brought in, engineered for alienation and control. Both work and nature are close to self-contained and interchangeable in relation to the project frame under these conditions and thus the project is ready for expansion." End quote. The second is from Fred Moten's Blackness and Nothingness, Mythic Mythicism in the Flesh. Quote, there is an ethics of the cut of contestation that I've tried to honor and illuminate because it instantiates and articulates another way of living in the world, a black way of living together in the other world. We are constantly making in and out of this world. In the alternative planetarity, that the intramural, internally indifferentiated presence, the surreal presence of blackness, serially brings online as persistent aeration, the incessant turning over of the ground beneath our feet, that is the indispensable preparation for the radical overturning of the ground that we are under." End quote. This alternative planetarity, the non-scalable and surreal eruption of blackness into and against planned for and planted ground is where Clementine Hunter and her art might be said to enter. In 1955, Hunter completed murals commissioned for the walls of African, this is African House, African House's second floor interior. African House is a structure, is a structure on the working 20th century plantation Melrose, located in Natchitoches Parish, Louisiana. These are the murals that she put up. On the walls of what was alternately remembered as a storehouse and a prison for enslaved people, Hunter painted scenes of fettered and unfettered gathering. Black women workers gathering cotton and pecans, church service and baptisms, nighttime dancing. Turning, turning towards the Im these images, I ask, what's at stake when these scenes of labor, prayer, and leisure move on a plantation architecture's walls. What happens to the wall when a mural takes root in life there? Moreover, what if what the murals do is imaginatively aerate the African house, reworlding an architectural terror as black social life is surreally and ethereally composed against the structure's own world-enclosing conceit? Finally, what's at stake when a black woman artist born into a family of sharecroppers, paints ecological innovation on the inside of the very place she once toiled as an overworked gatherer herself. For the first 50 years of her life, Hunter picked cotton and pecans, the former providing some enjoyment, according to the artist, and eventually moved to housekeeping at Melrose Plantation. Though she spent the second half of her life painting using old cardboard lampshades <clears throat> and most famously, the second floor interior of African House, we might say that Hunter never really left the field. On the one hand, following the definition of field as verb, Hunter was born in the late 19th century into a family of sharecroppers, come tenant farmers, and grew up within a deeply racialized set of economic conditions that sustained black poverty and indebtedness 
a being heldness by the field, planned for and plotted ground. This is all compounded by the continuation of labor extracted, extraction, sustained by a postbellum plantation economy that profited off her simultaneous labors as domestic worker slash housekeeper and working artist in the second half of her life. Concerning the latter, as art historian Mary Lyons observes, quote, the artist had little to say about the association for the preservation of a historical Natchitoches. In 1977, the association became the new owner of Melrose. It raised $7,000 by selling her posters held for her 100th birthday. <clears throat> the money was used to modernize her old cabin, paint it white, and move it closer to Melrose's big house. Hunter's former studio now sits prettily behind the big house. But lo one local person noted that the building never looked that nice when Clementine lived there. It puzzles me that Hunter had to worry about payments on her new mobile home while her art financed an empty exhibit cabin, end quote. This empty exhibit cabin, where she ostensibly didn't live post-renovation, bespeaks the trace of her celebrified presence in the plantation's afterlife. In fact, anyone wishing to see Clementine Hunter's original works is charged the price of a plantation tour, and the viewing or study of the African house murals in particular is circumscribed by the tour's timing. Any desire to return to the murals is met with another fee. Nonetheless, you can linger in front of her fake home however long you want. What is more, the plantation's gift shop is almost entirely filled with merchandise covered with reproductions of her privately owned painting, the one upside being that her grandson, James Hunter, painted the reproductions. The idea that her family might receive income from the gift shop's proceeds seemingly unsettles the reductions this otherwise storification of her life seemingly achieves. Still, the shape of Hunter's innovation, which concerns a non-scalable alignment of the plantation as planned for ground, with the unplanned and ungrounding scenes of black ecological enjoyment, bespeaks and does something to the field. On the one hand, to be fielded indexes a state of being caught or held, as in when the errancy of a ball or question is plucked from the air and managed. On the other, the field is noun, is deliberately altered, is defined alternately as enclosure and possibility, the latter bespeaking the unplanned for life that might take root there, the otherwise planetarity and intramural pastures threaded between a black woman laborer and the cotton she loved to be with. This duality of the field as enclosure and opening undoubtedly animates the above meditations on the touristic afterlife of Hunter's art, even as it presumes her life exceeds the telos of any possible tour. Part of what I want to think about in this paper then is what happens to anti-plantational innovation? when one's art is subjected to the entrapments that animate the kinds of scalar logics integral to the plantation itself. And in this case, when the purportedly vague non-scalarity of Hunter's visions are printed on fans used by those on a plantation tour. In a bucket by a small refrigerator carrying cold beverages, these fans are on sale for $2 a piece. On them are printed scenes of black women bent and picking cotton. The scene itself is an excerpt from one of the African house murals, the Harvest Time mural. This is the original. Powerfully, the, fr the fan traces an impossible gesture of scaling. The original scene was painted on one of African house's walls. She received little compensation for its creation and completion. Her poverty while alive contrasts viciously with the posthumous hyper-reproducibility of her work. On the one hand, the fan, as with the work it's said to show, elucidates the violent promiscuities of scale integral to the plantation's ongoing economic operation. Anna Singh writes, quote, scalability came into being with the European colonial plantation as it emerged between the 15th and 17th century. Sugar pl cane plantations can show us how. Early plantations were not designed with modern blueprints, as there were many dead ends. When the Spanish first tried planting cane in the Caribbean, for example, they employed Native American labor and used their mound planting methods, 
The cane grew, but the results were ordinary. In other words, non-scalable. When the Spanish saw what the Portuguese were doing in Brazil, they gave up mounds and copied the Portuguese. So it is to Portuguese experiments we lo might look to see how stable landscape elements were formed by contingency and friction. In the New World, the cane had no history of either companion species or disease relations. It was isolated, genetic isolates without interspecies ties. New World cane clones were the original non-souls, which is what um, Singh refers to as non-social elements, without transformative relations. They made fields ready for expansion. Through doing away with native peoples and seizing their lands, a vast terrain for experimentation with non-souls spread out before the European planters. Workers had to cut cane as fast as they could and with full attention just to avoid injury. Under these conditions, workers became autonomous units. Already considered commodities, they were given jobs made interchangeable by the monotonous regularity and coordinated timing engineered into the cane. Slaves were the next non-soul, design elements engineered for expansion without change, end quote. As a phrase, scalability originated in, in business, but instructively Singh frames it in the context of art, as in the capacity for a picture to retain its original shape when rescaled without pixelation. For Singh, yeah, let me just flip back to this. Um, for Singh, the digitally re reproduced picture is threatened by the errancy of the pixel. Pixels, quote, must remain uniform, separate, and autonomous. They cannot bleed into each other, end quote. Pixelation occurs when pixels become visible. In other words, their invisibility ensures the clarity of the picture. When you see the, picture, the pixel, the picture is a series of pieces, shards of light, the art quality is said to be degraded. What is more, anxiety around the degradation of the view, give it in concerns over pixelation, misses an even bigger picture. This is the life movement uncapturable in image, quote, the purported non-social landscape elements, quote, removed from the picture so as to sustain its coherence and its ongoing cooperation in scale. In other words, what is removed from this picture is the black social life essential to its making. That fan from Gel Melrose's gift shop is deeply pixelated. What the blur suggests is the removal of the socialities held by the mural. Perhaps the scandal of Hunter's own joy in the field with cotton. Removals <coughs> deemed necessary in the perverse transformation of an artwork once aerated with black life to an accessory to be used for someone else's comfort. Particularly, I was among an all-white group of plantation tourists and observed prior to the tour's beginning a white woman using the fan to stave off the Louisiana heat. The image of laboring black women affixed to a product that in this hysteria, scenario sustained a white woman's comfort seemed related, albeit complicatedly, to histories of commodity racism and the racist, sexist, plantational violences that betress the cult of white womanhood. What is more, even as actual black women weren't working for the white tourists, the scene itself was nonetheless, as all of us on the tour were, complicit with the plantation tourist affective economy sustained by what Stephen Smalls calls, quote, the symbolic annihilation of the slave cabin, end quote. Instructively, the symbolic annihilation of the slave cabin is achieved also by way of some devastating rescalings of history designed for post-bellum, post-racial comfort. The only former slave cabin mentioned on the tour gets not only annihilated by the guide's silence around its relationship to the estate's anti-blackness, the criminal and fraudulent ownership of life, but also through the ongoing erasures formed through whimsical musings on white postbellum renovation. Specifically, the fictively named Ghana House, that while a slave cabin is highlighted on the tour, yeah, let me, um, is highlighted on the tour as the one-time residence of white writer Francois Mignon. Here, rescaling moves in the symbolic conversion of anti-black architecture into white accommodation. Let me just take a little... <laughs> I was like, I'm perfectly not looking at you. Okay, so... Francois Mignon, okay, is an interesting person. He um, lies, basically. He lied about his, his, his artistic training. He said he was trained at the Sorbonne. Um, and he basically like establishes this really like storied career of like his history as like a French um, um, art historian. 
But his niece in the 80s was like, oh, yeah, that's Uncle Frank, right? <laughs> Uncle Frank grew up in upstate New York. So, like, he made shit up about his life. But then he goes to a plantation and is basically endowed with the capacity to rename <clears throat> structures, right? So it becomes, a, once again, even in a post-bellum iteration, a playground for white becomings, a playground for white fantasy. He names this structure Ghana House, and he claims it as his residence. So two, African House, right, was never named African House before Mignon showed up, right? He renamed slave cabins, right? Um, gentrifying, you might say, the plantation. Sorry for that detour. <laughs> Mel Mignon stayed at Ghana House while visiting Mel uh, Melrose during the plantation's mid-20th century, century career as an artist colony. So once historical Nac Nacogdoche Association bought the plantation, artists, white, mostly white artists, stayed on the plantation and made art while living in slave cabins. So I'm interested in thinking about the plantation, right, the plantation as a site for white art historical production and becoming and how it's fallen out of a particular history and how we need to bring it back. <clears throat> Significantly too, Mignon is historicized as the mind behind the African house murals. In keeping with my argument about field as verb, I question the political stakes of the narrative of Mignon as the murals commissioner and the way it traffics in a certain kind of fielding of the very artist imagined to be perfect for the job. Quote, Mignon realized immediately the potential significance of the murals, a primitive, this is all him, a primitive mural painted by a descendant of Africa in an African building that really will be original and perhaps arresting, end quote. This deeply racialized and gendered paternalism that moves as the untroubled rhetoric of Mignon's insight also animates his interrogated investment in a kind of realism, one that he continued to lament as a problem, let me get him off this. <laughs> Sorry, he stayed there way too, he stayed way too long, basically. Um, when he continued to lament as a problem of scales in Hunter's paintings, the absence of architectural, ecological, pictorial realism and accurate scale figures for Mignon as Hunter's aesthetic, which, is, which here is also deeply racialized and gender deficit. Quote, I did get a glimpse of the first panel, Architecturally, it's not that hot. Let me um, show you what he's talking about. The buildings va vaguely resembling the big house and the African house, but there is charm in the little trees. And later, he writes, simplicity of concept and a delightful childishness of execution inject a certain charm that is characteristic of the art, he wrote in his journal. All of his journals, which there's like thousands of pages, are held at UNC Chapel Hill. End quote. How might we think here the childishness of execution as an achievement, of non-scalability as beauty, even as its usage here reeks of racist and sexist paternalism? What if, following Fred Moten's remarks at this essay's beginning, the surreal expression of blackness, or the refusal of scalability's inherently mythic hold, is precisely the nature of Clementine Hunter's anti-plantational innovation? This is an innovation that quite literally enacts a turning over of the ground beneath our feet. Such turning over can be quite explicit and realized in Hunter's patronly assertions against Mignon's suggestions. I quote from Mignon again here. He writes, I sat with her as she gave the big house a fresh coat of paint, lightening it up wonderfully. And when that had been achieved, I casually jockeyed her into the cotton chopping section and asked how she thought a white, whitish line around the interior of the cabin and closing the wedding scene would look. She liked the idea and proved her point that would enhance the value of the wedding. Then I edged her over to the cotton picking section and after admiring it much, I asked her if she thought the horse uh, would look better if it, his said horse was darker in contrast with the red wagon and white coffin. It was though the ideas for her own, the horse metamorphosis from red to black in a jiffy. After a little further chat about the church in the same section, she somehow got the idea that there ought to be some black lines to indicate some steps and others to indicate a window as the extent of whiteness seemed excessive, end quote. This passage, this is my favorite line, even though he's terrible. This passage from Mignon's journal bespeaks a managerial comportment both toward artists and artwork. Moreover, Mignon's investment in Melrose's lifelike realization, as if anything like life ever flourished in keeping the plantation to scale, manifests in a certain kind of overseeing, 
Even though Mignon and Hunter aren't literally entrapped in the field's bloodied racial and sexual logics and violences, his, quote, edging her over to the cotton picking section, end quote, cannot be thought outside the lingering machinations of that relation. Even still, the excessive, the excessive whiteness of the canvas is ruptured by Hunter's innovation. Black lines build passage while they make possible the indication of a window, an architectural and ecological turning over. That is, turning over what visionless curators figure as, quote, primitive, advances loopholes in windowless buildings, along with larger innovations of relationalities between people, atmosphere, animals, plants, and water. What is at stake in thinking this innovation as a black feminine ecological undoing, where all earthly life returns to a prior intimacy disrupted by the non-love of plantational desire. In many ways, Hunter's art already moves against the racial, sexual, gender, and economic logics of the fan. Its complicity with the violent flattening out of black female art and creativity, as well as with plantation rhetorics of scalability. That is, her surrealist art shows up as scalar difference in all of her art on all the panels, black women tend to be painted larger than men, and an ecological reordering. This particular scene, I don't know if you can read it, um, Mignon um, says this is a mistake of Hunter's. Um, he said that a fellow citizen was looking at the panel and said, asked um, Mignon if, quote, would them two ladies there be Jesus' sisters, inquired the man viewing the picture for the first time. I figure they all must because I noticed the, they're walking on water. What if that wasn't a mistake? That is, her surrealist art shows up as both scalar difference, black women tend to be painted larger than men, and at ecological reordering, flesh is held up, not drowned by water. In the case of the Harvest Time memorial, Hunter's aerial view of the field opens it, making it look less as a division than as a multiplication of ground. We might say then that such innovation disturbs the economic logic of black female gatherings fungibility and that way overturns the ground and levitates the waters attempting to pull her and her art under. Most explicitly, we might say with the, that what the murals generate is another kind of atmosphere, one where the intimacies between people and the earth and with each other flourish, where the blur of color, tree into flesh into air, inexplicable aquatic kinship, stays harbored in the unknowable feeling of paint against the composer's brush. Maybe when Clementine Hunter made those black lines, she was asserting that the whiteness of the canvas was never originary, that its realism was predicated on the erasure of the black and native and interspecies assertions of passage and communion, a presumption that gatherings, entrenchment, and agricultural labor and extraction precludes other forms of being together, other forms of gathering, unscalable modalities of raration, sensation, and intimacy that only the people in and of the painting can ever feel. Thank you. Um, just a couple things. This is a, a truncated version of a paper, uh, an article in a collected volume on Tina Hitzi Coates' work, right? Actually, uh, J. Cameron Carter is also participating in this, right? Contributing an article. It's people, theologians and, and philosophers of religion who are responding to Coates' work. So it's a truncated version of that. Also, one of the reasons I'm, I'm interested in Coates is because many of my students know his work. They've never heard of Richard Wright, <laughs> never heard of James Baldwin, or that person who writes a blurb on the back, Toni Morrison. Some of them have not even heard of her. So it's frustrating, but it's also a way for me to introduce their work through, through Coates. So. With all the praise that ta Coates Coates between, uh, between the world and me has received, one consistent target of criticism is the lack of hope in Coates' vision. For many commentators, Coates offers a trenchant assessment of black American life and the systemic violence that routinely threatens to possess and erase the black body. At the same time, these commentators accuse Coates of rejecting the possibility of a better alternative to the current state. Because he assumes that we are stuck in our predicament, he does not feel obligated to offer a determinate solution to the problems that he diagnoses. Conservative New York Times columnist David Brooks, well, or moderate, depending on how, right? Exemplifies the sentiment when, in his brief uh, response to Between the World and Me, he suggests that Coates offers no hope, hope for change, in large part because he renounces the American dream. Michelle Alexander, author of the widely acclaimed uh, The New Jim Crow, contends that unlike Coates' literary predecessor, James Baldwin, Coates devalues the importance of believing that the raci racial order can be transformed. She writes, quote, rather than urging his son to awaken to his own power, Coates emphasizes over and over the apparent permanence of racial injustice in America, 
the foolishness of believing that one person can make a change, and the dangers of believing in the American dream, end quote. For Alexander, those on the progressive side of things must believe in the prospect of justice, a prospect that Coase apparently deems impossible. While Brooks and Alexander have different political commitments, they share a concern about Coates' pessimism, his relentless negativity that declines uh, a re reassuring moment of affirmation. And what follows, I contend that these commentators evade the thrust of Coates' argument. For Coates, I want to argue traditional sites and sources, tr traditional sites and sources of hope, especially the American dream and fantasies of progress, uh, simultaneously rely on and disavow the social death of black bodies. In other words, many of the nation's collective self-images and narratives of inspiration work to mollify and diminish the tragic quality of, of America's racial formations. For Coates, a different kind of hope is made possible through remembrance, struggle, and aesthetics. In a manner that conjures Baldwin, Coates' Between the World and Me offers a uh, contemporary interpretation of American innocence and the American dream's incessant assault on the black body. In the opening, opening section of the text, Coates writes, quote, white people's progress or rather the progress of those Americans who believe they are white, is built on looting and violence. Here Coates introduces a familiar connection between progress and erasure, between the survival and advancement of dominant forms of life and the violent campaigns against bodies that stand in the way of progress or that need to be contained and managed for progress to happen. Among other fraught relationships, Coates is alluding to the association between, uh, association between America's wealth and chateau slavery, the nation's territorial expansion and war, or the general relationship between the accumulation of capital and exploitation or theft. By using the language of built on, Coates suggests that violence and theft are foundational, constitutive elements of progress. It is not that the material and psychic benefits of liberal democracy, capital, citizenship, and property ownership have yet to be expanded to include the presently excluded. For Coates, these markers of progress rely on the systemic subordination of black bodies, thereby, re thereby rendering anti-black violence structural and endemic to progress. It is important here that Coates uses the term belief in this passage when discussing whiteness suggesting that whiteness is not a natural property or attribute reducible to skin color. Rather it is, and this is, uh, I'm indebted here to my conversations with my colleague, J. Cameron Carter. Rather it is more like a social imaginary that requires belief and investment in purity, wholeness, and the value of possession. While Coase does not develop this line of thought, we can infer that the project of whiteness read as belief in and the practice of purity and innocence can conscript subjects and communities that, that the racial order marks as non-white. Right? What is certain for Coates is that whiteness and progress both produce and disavow the violence necessary to maintain these projects. These investments promote, quote, the, the elevation of the belief in being white, which was not achieved only through wine tastings and ice cream socials, but through the, this is his language, right? But through the pillaging of life, liberty, labor, and land, through the flaying of backs, the chaining of limbs, the strangling of, of dissidents, the destruction of families, the rape of mothers, the sale of children. It is also important that Coates juxt uh, juxtaposes lofty ideals or dreams with repeated images of the black body that for him is always in danger of being dispossessed. In the above passage, for instance, Coates underscores the flaying of backs and the chaining of limbs. The reader is prompted to encounter images of bodies being strangled and black women being sexually coerced by slave masters. The reader cannot easily evade a legacy of bodies being twisted, hung, and punctured. These images or scenes of bodily violence produce a set of affects that cut against the grain of idealized notions like freedom and progress. Similarly, Coates' recurrent allusion to the seized black body prevents us from disentangling what, what, what Coates calls the dream or the fantasy of American plenitude and supremacy from the, bodies, from the black body's vulnerability to coercion and containment. If, as Coates points out, the dream includes perfect houses and nice lawns, this dream, he says, rests on our, our, on our backs, the bedding made from our bodies. In addition, if the dream involves having one's rights and freedoms protected by the law, Coates suggests that the idea and practice of legal protection necessarily depends on a notion of a threat that needs to be regulated, monitored, and disciplined. As Coates puts it to his son, Quote, the law did not protect us, and now in your time the law has become an excuse for stopping and frisking you, which is to say for furthering the assault on your body, end quote. Here Coe suggests that there is an insidious relationship between law, fantasy, and anti-blackness. The protection of the order of things, or the dream of order, largely depends on rendering black bodies disproportionately susceptible to state surveillance and violence. As Simone Brown describes, there is a long history of surveillance practices or strategies, from policing black life under slavery to stop and frisk, that mark the black body as matter out of place, or matter that needs to be put in its, po uh, its proper place. To use Mary Douglas's language, the imagined order of things relies on marking certain bodies as dirt, as sources of incoherence and danger, sites of disorder that have to be eliminated or confined in some manner. Black people, among other groups, have historically been conflated with that in incoherent excess that troubles dreams of, of purity and coherence, and blackness also attracts violent measures to contain that imagined excess. While most people might not intend racism, Coates argues that, quote, a very large number of Americans will do all they can to preserve the dream, 
a dream that sustains itself at the expense of black bodies. So similar to Baldwin, Coates contends that, quote, there exists all around us an apparatus urging us to accept American innocence at face value and not to inquire too much into it. This apparatus, discourses, laws, rituals, images, cultural common sense, produces subjects that routinely disentangle freedom from violence, that subordinate losses and suffering to progress, that place a premium, premium on American life or those lives that more closely approximate the ideal American citizen, and that privileges the infinite possibilities of the future over the contradictions of the past and present. The dream and presumption of innocence uh, generate tendencies to imagine oneself as separate from and above the uh, messiness that is history. It, enable, it enables us to associate dirt and incoherence with other subject positions and communities, downplaying our own entanglements with and vulnerabilities to the unpleasant realities and conditions. For Coates, this is not a predicament that is unique to white America. In fact, Coates warns being black does not immunize, from, does not immunize us from history's logic or the lure of the dream. In addition, Coates suggests that the American dream or the innocent myth is not necessarily exceptional. It is one powerful example of a human tendency to fabricate, perform, and cling to narratives that work to tame the unwieldy quality of life and history. Those, for instance, who respond to the legacy of colonization and anti-black racism by invoking nostalgic, idyllic images of a pre-colonial Africa are, according to Coates, beholden to a similar underlying fantasy as those tethered to the American dream. Both accept, he says, comforting myths that dissuade us from, comfort, um, from confronting humanity and all of its terribleness. Of course, we should raise serious doubts about the possibility of eliminating myth, fantasy, and the need to mediate and mitigate the tragic. In fact, tra tragedy necessarily comes with its own myths and narratives. Yet we can see that for Coates, the possibility of something better depends on interrogating our desires for wholeness and purity and being more receptive to the terribleness that is our human condition, a terribleness that is exacerbated by all too human yearnings for wholeness and innocence. It is tempting to interpret Coates' diagnosis of the racial order as a popular version of Afro-pessimism, a discourse that has recently gained traction in Afro uh, academic circles. Although I cannot do justice to the still emerging discourse and the space allotted, I take Afro-pessimism as articulated by Frank Wilderson III and Jared Sexton to be reimagining standard ways of thinking about race, recognition, and the human. While many strands of the black freedom struggle, uh, certain strands of the black freedom struggle assume that the end goal of black strivings is recognition and inclusion within the sphere of the human, Afro-pessimists question this possibility, especially since the domain of the human is defined over and against blackness. Riffing on authors like Frantz Fanon and Hortense Spillers, the pessimist, the pessimist contends that the sphere of recognition and law is made possible by simultaneously producing and excluding blackness by permanently banishing blackness to a constitutive outside. As Wilderson puts it, quote, whereas humans exist on, the, on some plane of being and thus can be, become existentially present through some struggle or through recognition, blacks cannot reach this plane. Consequently, Hegel's master-slave relationship cannot be resolved or brought to a higher moment of reconciliation in the context of the black slave. For the pessimist, the struggle for recognition happens on a plane whose very coherence and legibility depends on the violent exclusion of the black or abject body. Among the many implications of this Afro-pessimist formulation is, is ironically a potential rethinking of the pessimist-optimist binary. Perhaps pessimism is always a relative term or a term that makes sense in relationship to an object. So pessimistic with respect to what? More specifically, Afro-pessimism might understandably respond with a kind of cynicism to the social order structurally defined by anti-blackness, an anti-black apparatus that is often justified and mitigated by narratives of optimism and achievement. But this does not mean that the Afro-pessimist cannot think and imagine otherwise. It does mean, however, that any alternative imagination always emerges in the break within the painful void that uh, the black pessimist inhabits. Like the Afro-pessimist, Coates can be read as moving beyond the optimism-pessimism binary. Even though comment, uh, commentators like Brooks and Alexander accuse Coates of abandoning hope, it is not clear that his text accomplishes the surrender. What is, clear is what, Coates is, what is clear to me is that Coates is refusing some of the dominating emblems and sources of optimism, such as the American dream, progress, and to some extent, black Christianity. This refusal does not preclude Coates from gesturing toward other sites of hope and possibility. Moreover, Coates' tendency to tarry with antagonisms without offering some kind of comforting resolution might suggest that we, we should redefine the very notion of hope or compel the regime of hope to give way to other kinds of desires, affects, and attachments that better register the complexities involved in being a, being a black subject. Coates seems to anticipate the charge that his book is an expression of despair. In a provocative passage that deals with themes of remembrance, redemption, and cynicism, he admonishes his son, you must struggle to remember the past and all its nuance, error, and humanity. You must resist the common urge toward the comforting narrative of divine law, toward fairy tales that uh, imply some ir uh, ir uh, irrepressible justice. The enslaved were not bricks in your road, and their lives were not chapters in your redemptive history. Our triumphs can never compensate for enslavement. Perhaps our triumphs are never even the point. Perhaps struggle is all we have because the God of history is an atheist. Wow, yeah, the God of history is an atheist, and nothing about the world is meant to be. So you must wake up every morning knowing that no promise is unbreakable, least of all the promise of waking up at all. 
This is not despair. These are the preferences of the universe itself, verbs over nouns, actions over states, struggle over hope. In this passage, Coach suggests that remembrance must always watch out for or be vigilant for narratives that readily instrumentalize the past, that turn the traumas and struggles of the past into an occasion for future redemption or deliverance. Similar to Walter Benjamin, Coach indicates that the past might uh, the past might make a claim on us to remember and to mourn, but this claim cannot be settled cheaply. One of the ways in which the claims of the past are settled cheaply or without much expenditure and self-loss is by assuming that the achievements of the present compensate for the losses of the past. Triumphant accounts, accounts of history, as, as Benjamin and Coates suggest, relegate the dissonant quality of suffering and violence, that quality that disturbs and unsettles us, reminding us that historical forms of violence remain unresolved and part of the broken present. To say that the enslaved are not chapters in our redemptive history is to refuse a logic that places suffering uh, in an unfolding telos, that subordinates legacies of struggles to collective investments in a harmonious, unified future. This re resembles Benjamin's claim that resistance and dissent are emboldened more by the, quote, image of enslaved ancestors rather than that of liberated grandchildren. In opposition to traditional redemptive narratives, Coates underscores the beauty and permanence of struggle. The intractability of struggle is not despair, but perhaps is always being traversed and haunted by the inescapability of despair, moments of hopelessness, that appear unproductive to the order of things. Coates links struggle to a Nietzsche-like to Nietzsche ontology of becoming. The universe, perhaps indifferent to our goals and aspirations, is defined by flux, movement, and verbs. Coates seems to invoke Nietzsche directly by calling the god of history an atheist, suggesting that even God is subject to the whims and vicissitudes of temporal existence. Even gods die, something that Christian theologians might not demur if they read the implications of God's death differently. For Coates, every promise is breakable because human plans and projections cannot escape human mortality and contingency. What we thought was meant to be, or the fulfillment of destiny, is for Coates a product of contingent events, forces, and interactions. Thus he tells his son he must make peace with the chaos, that he must accept the gap between our structuring frameworks of meaning and the unpredictable forces of the universe. But to make peace with the chaotic flow of life and history is also to acknowledge that we cannot remain in the space of utter chaos. In other words, humans will always need narratives, metaphors, and practices that make sense of and manage the disruptive moments of the universe. In addition to the ontological and atheological implications of struggle, we can also delineate the political con consequences of Coates' uh, affirmation of incessant striving. By affirming verbs over nouns and actions over states, Coates is not necessarily denying the importance and necessity of goals within political movements. He is indicating that the goals of any struggle, redistributing wealth, ending police violence in working class black communities, ecological justice, should never become reified ends. What is more vital for Coates is the process of striving, the mobile and variegated struggles of black bodies against a resilient system defined by anti-blackness, by affirming movement and contestation over states and destinations, Coates implies that there will always be tensions, antagonisms, constraints, and fissures that selves will encounter, qualities that are often diminished when we cling to unified ends and reconciled futures. By privileging struggle over hope, Coates also indirectly responds to the Obama regime and the mantra of hope that accompanied Obama's ascendancy. Even though many resist the notion that Obama's presidency is a sign of a post-racial society, there remains a general assumption that the first black president is a kind of fulfillment of black freedom struggles. Well, I wrote this before Trump, Trump's um, victory, right? Uh, so it's, the conversation gets more complicated, but I'm still willing to think about that kind of optimism. Um, flattens the complexities and richness of, of these struggles, not to mention the more radical possibilities opened up by black liberation movements. Therefore, coach should be interpreted as a refusing a certain kind of hope, the kind of hope attached to triumphant narratives of achievement that subordinate dissonance to harmony or instability to order. In addition, the affirmation of movement and striving over hope suggests that hope might not be the best term to, to describe how people relate to the world's limitations and possibilities. In fact, coach reveals that love, a difficult kind of love describes his rapport with the world, potentially replacing the primacy of hope. In opposition to despair and cynicism, he tells his son, I am not a cynic, I love you, and I love the world. I love it more with every inch I discover. Although Coates does not flesh out what this love of the world looks like, this invocation of love provokes several questions. Why does he, contra why does he contrast love with cynicism instead of hope and cynicism? What is the relationship between love, novelty, and discovery? What affects are directly associated with love that are less salient in the mantra of hope? Is it important that in addition to his son, love's object is the world and therefore not limited to America or the United States of America, the nation state, et cetera? What are the limitations of a love ethic for political strivings? Or inversely, how might a love ethic expand our conception of politics? If we follow Toni Morrison and the psychoanalytic tradition, can we imagine love as an ambivalent attachment always intertwined with disgust, anguish, and painful pleasure? How much time do I have? Oh, I speak too fast. Okay, good. I got time for the rest of this. Good. Conclusion, right? So in the okay, thanks. So in the conclusion, right, in the, in the paper, when I, 
What I want to think about is actually the relationship between Coates' project and Sadia Hartman's project, right? Around this notion of the ethics of the opaque that she's getting from Glissant and others, right? Um, in, in religious studies, we think of someone like Charles Long, right? What's interesting me, to me is how the, 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 the ethics of the opaque is either troubling or eliding certain kinds of distinctions, right? Certain kinds of binaries, right? Freedom, violence, freedom, constraint. But in particularly uh, her, her section on the Sorrow Song, as she reads it through Frederick Douglass and W.B. Du Bois, right? There's a way in which a certain ethics of opacity is troubling a distinction between pain and pleasure, anguish, hope, right? That these 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 affects, right? Or these um, these affects and emotions that we usually see as being right uh, incompatible, right? And being contrasted with each other are kind of fused in a way, right? So this ethics of the opaque, uh, right, I want to suggest is something that Tennessee Coates could potentially develop in his thought a little bit more, right? There's a section at the end of Between the World and Me that's really interesting to me. It's after he's talking about a kind of homecoming uh, at, 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 Howard, at Howard University. If you notice, if there's any moment of hope in the text, right, it's usually at, it's at, it's at Howard, which he calls the Mecca, which is interesting to me, right? And when he goes to France in complicated ways, right? That was a moment. A joyous moment beyond the dream, a moment imbued by a power more gorgeous than any voting rights bill. This power, this black power, originates in a view of the American galaxy taken from a dark and essential planet. Black power is the dungeon side view, which is to say the view taken in struggle. Even the dreamers, lost in the great reverie, feel it for it is in Billy, they reach for in sadness, and mob deep is what they holler in boldness, and Isley they hum in love, and Dre they yell in revelry, and Aretha, the last time they hear before dying. We have made something down here. Here at the Mecca, under pain of selection, we have made a home. As do black people on summer blocks marked with needles, vials, and hopscotch squares. As do black people dancing it out at rent parties. As do black people at their family reunions, where we are regarded as, as the survivors of a catastrophe. As do black people toasting their cognac and German beers, passing their blunts and debating MCs. As do all of us who have voyaged through the death to life upon these shores. I think for him and for me, it was quite obvious that his interest in even just spending the time with men, some his age and older, um, says a whole lot for what his thinking was. Um, so my question to you within the context of how you address this notion, the struggle around understanding Tom Hansen, um, is taking it one step further beyond just between the world and, it, and it's in the realm of comics mm. because mm -hmm. of his role as writer of presently still unfolded saga of the child. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know if you've looked at some of that or not, and if so that's where I'm interested mm -hmm. in seeing how that might reflect or parallel any of your interpretation yeah. of, uh, his, of his collection right. of Essays, if not mm -hmm. letters. Letters, yeah. Thank you so much for the question. I, I'm very interested in uh, the stuff he's doing around the Black Panther kind of series. Um, I'm interested in general, um, as somebody in religious studies, how comic books have become the kind of present day myths for us, right? That comic, comic characters have become all these kind of like supernatural transcendent characters, right? So what, what will be interesting to me, um, I haven't read much yet, but it will be interesting to me as, as they, they emerge in this film that's emerging in a couple years, right? How, um, how, how the characters, right, in many ways, as, as, as embodiments of a certain kind of myth, right, will they hold on to this kind of tragic, tragic dimension that I think he's articulating in his work, right? Or will they be characters that are, that are trying to transcend that or, or transcend those limitations, those tragic limitations, in a way that he, I think he calls the dream of the fantasy, right? Um, I, mean, I don't know if I was making sense, but I think what's interesting to me is the way that he's pushing back against certain kinds of myths in, in between the world and me, right? Right? There's a way in which he's, you can see him as pushing back against certain kinds of myths, right? or myth per se. Right? There's something about myths and the structure of fantasy that, 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 that um, diminishes the terribleness of but, but it seems to me there's something about these, these black suits and the superheroes in general that are our new myths. Right? And I, I would suggest that myth and narrative can't live without that. So maybe that's him trying to think with new kinds of myths right? and affirming blackness in a certain type of way. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe if there are a few questions, yeah, I see three. If we could maybe say them all and then allow the panel to the, sort of close out with a response to all three, if that's okay. Yeah, I'm gonna have an observation slash question goes for you. I um, really enjoyed your talk. It resonated with me mostly because um, loud music is synonymous with my blackness in a lot of ways. Um, so I grew up in dance school, 
And you know, it was very important for the bass and the volume of the music to be really loud. Mm -hmm. On my drive to work, the volume of the music is a tool for healing and music therapy to deal with everything that's going on in the world. Um, and as a hip hop scholar, I think about how the city is regulated music within the parks to stop mm -hmm. black and Latino music mm -hmm. from expressing themselves through hip hop. And so my question is, um, what interested me in the opinion, you know, the regulation and hindrance of, of blackness through music volumes, mm -hmm. um, and I really appreciated how you, you know, approached it from a Caribbean standpoint, and more specifically at Jamaica, um, but there's parallels within America as well. Um, and even, like, side note, um, I typically come over here to go to the car wash, go to the car wash because I try to support black businesses, but there's a new car wash near where I live, um, and it allows you to drive through, but then you um, come back from your own car, wipe it down, so it's pretty cheap, it's cheaper. Right. Um, right. Oh, but there's a sign, and there's a very loud, a large sign that says "No loud music." Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. reading that really mm -hmm. like felt like like a punch in the mm -hmm. face because mm -hmm. it's clear that it's targeting right. people of color exactly. when they come to the car wash. And so I struggle mm -hmm. with going to that car wash, going to drive a few minutes, right. and back over here. Right. So, thank you. So I, I want to ask uh, two questions really quickly. One is for Petal, and I appreciate um, the first comments here, um, but I was also thinking about the authors of that, um, that sometimes as a citizen, as opposed to a tourist, that's also, you know, why is there music at this point, if I, you know, have to get up this early in the morning, something like that. Um, so I'm wondering about sound and noise is also articulating various kinds of differences, mm -hmm. um, some of which maybe seem like they may be anxious to class, but also the complicated um, mm -hmm. these, uh, sort of, I don't know, uh, right. one's relation to um, that particular strategy or tactic. And right, maybe right, right. Is maybe extendable to other kinds of um, right. uh, insurgent practices. Yeah. Um, and then uh, maybe related, maybe not related question for Sarah. Um, your well, comment, your uh, account of Mignon edging uh, 17 after over to revise these uh, images was really um, resonant for me, as well as her, um, you know, pushback or seeming uh, engagement with etc. Um, thinking about the Library of Congress's recordings in the Voices of Slavery collection, mm -hmm. where you have interviewers kind of trying to elicit a certain kind of narrative for the survivors of slavery. Um, and the ways that they interrupt that prompting, oftentimes, I mean, these are very, very aged people for the most part, and wanting, for example, to give advice about how to live a good life as opposed to recount the specific narratives. So I'm really interested in the way that you're picking up on um, questions of scalability and the use of circulation, you know, like the Library of Congress posting these right. um, for any any kind of social sense of it, right? Um, mm -hmm. But then uh, um, also, are there ways that, that you, you might push back against sort of extending? Because part of your paper seems also to be talking about scalability as um, as part of a, a, a problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try and make this as coherent as possible. Um, <clears throat> I continue to think about one of the panels that we had yesterday, um, where uh, it's actually the first panel, and Jonathan's work on the deep, um, Danielle's work on um, just the, the black geographies, and, and um, we kind of came to this point where we we're talking about. Um, letting go of the land, but at the same time holding on to it because of um, its, its, its meaning, its importance um, to black progress and so forth. And so hearing, I, I hate that I missed your presentation title, but hearing the two of yours and thinking about this reclamation of those houses, uh, those plantation houses, um, and you use the word gentrification, um, and then I'm thinking about uh, opacity, yeah. the deep. Um, you know, how do we let go of hope? How do we how do we let go of those those myths, those things that we held on to um, 
that are almost sort of cultural signposts, I guess, um, that, that, have, that we see as, as a part of black legacy and helping us to like get through, make a way out of no way, you know, and move forward, and at the same time, not allow those, the, the, the mythic, um, I guess, um, nature of that sort of thinking to limit us and to hold us back and to and how do we help it or how do we let it go so that we reduce the trauma that comes from trying to hold on um so i think there are two other questions but that, there was a lot in those three and i don't want to overload the panel um uh, maybe i'll allow them to respond and if there's some space i'd love to make room for your questions as well uh, so I, I guess I'll start with the question of what interested me in this topic, and I thank you for your comments. And um, so there are a, a number of different kind of um, cases that I encountered that um, helped me to recognize that there was a pattern, at least. And many of them were cases that were happening in the US. So the two that I mentioned but also there was a recent um, noise case against uh, drummers in Marcus Garvey Park in Harlem. So there, recently there was this um, you know, new condo complex that's been erected on the Upper West Side. And um, there are a group of drummers who regularly congregate in the park every Friday and drum until about 10 PM. But since this condo complex has been erected, the residents of the complex have been like, we can't sleep. This is this is too noisy. So they've been filing noise complaints, and then you know, and then the residents of the neighborhood have been viewing this as you know an, another attempt to push black residents out of the neighborhood. So that's one case that um, really occurred to me. But actually, what brought me to the sort of Caribbean branch of my project was I was reading Zong, and Zong is a poem by a. Tobagan Canadian poet named Marlene Norbese Philip. And I was trying to make sense of what she was doing in these moments where she superimposed text and, and gave the kind of visual sonic effect of, uh, of cacophony. And um, a while I was thinking through that poem, I was doing some archival research in Jamaica and I came across these colonial correspondences complaining about how noise is, is so disrupting um, everyday life in kind of 1930s Jamaica. So I started wondering um, if there was a way that um, Norbese was using that, kind, that sense of cacophony and disruption um, to create the effect that the colonial authorities are reporting in their, in their letters. So that's, that's sort of what, what brought me to, um, to that branch of my work. But also, I have endless anecdotes about how um, ideas about how um, black women should, can appropriately exist within the soundscape and, and having to kind of constantly be concerned about whether you know, you're too loud or so on. Um, and thank you, Sitsi, for your question. And, I, and I'm, this um, is something that I, I'm really trying to find a way to, to work into the language of my project, because there are, really are a wider range of complainants and a wider range of, of people who enjoy this kind of noisy music than, than I've kind of represented here because um, there are a number of um, cases. I, I look at Jamaica and Trinidad both, and there are a number of, and Barbados, of um, Jamaicans and Trinidadians and, and Bajans who live on the island saying, this is unacceptable, it's too loud, I can't sleep, and I have to go to work, and my kids have to study, and this is, this is terrible. Um, and then, you know, there's also, in the colonial correspondences, there are references to these um, kind of tourists who are coming to Jamaica because they want to be enthralled in whatever the noise is signifying. They want to get kind of wrapped up in some kind of illicit activity. And they're concerned that that's what Jamaica is going to come to be known for. So there are a really complex range of kind of desires um, at play. Um, but I, um, there are ways that the institutional responses to noise by the Environmental Management Agency or the, the EPA in Jamaica um, 
respond more swiftly and more powerfully to complaints coming from particular sectors, so coming from tourists, that's the moment when they, they feel that they have to produce some kind of formal institutional response to, to their sort of aural discomfort. So it raises questions about whose aural comfort and discomfort really, really matters and who's protected by the sort of, you know, general noise laws that are being put in place when um, there are specific venues that are being kind of um, singled out and targeted. 